Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Sunshine. It's just such a pleasure and an honor to be back here. Um, I mean, I've been affiliated with Metcalf for a long time. I had to leave the board when I moved to Colorado. Uh, but, uh, you know, this institute is doing such important work to ultimately to make sure that the American public and really the, the world's public as much as possible uh, is scientifically literate, that we can make good decisions as a society based on solid science. And you may wonder why uh, a book about an eclipse would be, re would be appropriate today, but I promise you, uh, you will see the connections as I go on. And before I get to my slides, uh, I'm just going to make a few initial remarks. And let me ask you all a question. How many of you have plans for August 21st of this year? Ah, excellent. I'm glad to see that, but still most of you didn't raise your hand. Uh, I've, been, I've known what I would be doing on August 21st of 2017 for 19 years. Uh, and, and that's because on August 21st of this year, a total solar eclipse will cross the United States coast to coast for the first time in 99 years. This is a big deal, and I will explain why. Uh, but I saw my first total solar eclipse uh, 19 years ago, and that's when I got the idea for the book. Um, so I've been working on this for that long. And it, uh, but actually the story of, of how I saw the eclipse and how I became an eclipse chaser goes back even further than that. So in 1994, I was working for NPR and there was a solar eclipse, a partial solar eclipse that was set to cross the country. And I did a story about it for, for Morning Edition and I interviewed an astronomer, a fellow named Jay Pasikoff at Williams College. And he explained what was going to happen and how to view it, but he emphasized that, you know, there's an enormous difference between a partial solar eclipse and a total solar eclipse. In a total solar eclipse, the moon completely blocks the face of the sun for all of two or three minutes, usually. But as Jay described it, it is the most awe-inspiring spectacle in all of nature. And what Jay Pasikoff, this astronomer, told me, I, will rem I remember to this day, he said to me, before you die, you owe it to yourself to experience a total solar eclipse. Well, this I was actually a little awkward. I mean, it was a very intimate sort of thing to say, but, but I took it seriously. So I started to do some research. And first of all, if you, want, if you wait for a total solar eclipse to come to you, you're probably going to be waiting a very long time. Uh, any given point on Earth sees a total solar eclipse about once every 400 years. But if you're willing to travel, you don't have to wait that long. And so I discovered that in 1998, a total eclipse was going to cross the Caribbean. Well, a total eclipse can only be seen in a very narrow zone, about 100 miles wide. That's where the moon's shadow falls, and it's called the path of totality. And in February 1998, the path of totality was going to cross Aruba. Well, I thought February, Aruba, it sounded like a good idea anyway. <laughs> So I made plans to go down there to, to enjoy the sun and see what happened when the sun briefly went away. So February 26, 1998, found me and many other people out on the beach behind the Hyatt Regency waiting for the show to begin. And a, a total eclipse, eclipse begins as a partial eclipse, as the moon slowly makes its way in the front of the sun. And uh, you can only look at it safely with eclipse glasses, with these very, very dark lenses, darker than sunglasses. And, it was all very interesting. The moon carved a little bite out of the edge of the sun, and then the bite grew larger and larger, and then the sun became a crescent, and it was interesting, but I wouldn't say it was, you know, it wasn't the spectacle that Jay Pasikoff said it would be. Well, about 10 minutes before the total eclipse was set to begin, weird things started to happen. So first, here we are on this tropical beach, and a cool wind kicks up, and, and the quality of daylight is just getting very strange. Colors have shifted, and I noticed that that shadows have become bizarrely sharp. It's if someone had turned up the contrast knob on TV. And then I looked under the palm trees and I could see that where daylight was dappling the ground, instead of just spots of light, they were little crescents. So the, the spaces between the leaves were acting as pinhole projectors, projecting onto the sand images of the crescent sun. And then I looked offshore and I noticed running lights on boats. So clearly it was getting dark, but I hadn't realized it. And then, all of a sudden, the lights go out. And at that, a cheer just erupts from the beach. And I take off my eclipse glasses, because at this point, 
at the, during the total phase of a total eclipse, that is the only time it is safe to look at the sun with the naked eye. And I was just absolutely dumbfounded. Uh, you know, here, here I was in my mid-30s. I'd lived on Earth long enough to know what the sky looks like, right? I mean, I've seen blue skies and gray skies and starry skies and angry skies and pink skies at sunrise. But this was a sky I had never seen. So first there were the colors. Overhead, it was this deep purple gray, like twilight. But on the horizon, it was orange all around me, like a 360 degree sunset. And up above, in the twilight, bright stars and planets had come out. So this is the middle of the day. Uh, I, so there I could see Mercury and Jupiter, and there was Venus, and they were all in a line. And along that line was this thing, this glorious, bewildering thing hanging out there in space. And it looked like a wreath that had been woven from silvery thread. Uh, and, uh, this was the sun's outer atmosphere, the solar corona. And pictures just don't do it justice. It's not just some simple ring or halo around the sun. It's finely textured, like it's made out of strands of silk. And although it looked nothing like our sun, I knew that that was the sun. And there was the sun, and there were the planets, and I could see how the planets go around the sun. It's like I had left our solar system and was looking back at creation. And it just all made sense. And for the first time in my life, I felt viscerally connected to the universe in all of its immensity. I, this is, I think, what they call nirvana. <laughs> and it lasted for 174 seconds, under three minutes, when all of a sudden, it was over. The sun came back out, the blue sky returned, the stars and the planets and the corona were gone, life returned to normal, but I had been permanently changed. That is how I became an umbrophile. That's why now I spend my time and hard-earned money every couple of years heading off to wherever the moon's shadow will fall to re-experience that. And that is how I got the idea 19 years ago to write a book about eclipse chasing. Um, and, but I knew back in 1998 that the time to come out with the book would be the summer of 2017 because this is when Americans would care about eclipses. So I put the project on hold, and as the years passed, I began to hunt for a good eclipse story to tell, one that seemed worthy of a book. And the story I stumbled on, it so happens, comes from the part of the world where I now live, which is the American West. So the, uh, the West, of course, is a landscape that's filled with history and with legends. The gunfight at the OK Corral, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Calamity Jane, Buffalo Bill, it's sometimes hard to distinguish where facts end and fiction begins. And six years ago, I came across a particularly puzzling tale from the Old West. Now, I live in Colorado, but if you go north of there to Wyoming, if you drive across the Laramie Plains, head over the snowy range of the Medicine Bow Mountains, you'll find yourself in the Sierra Madres, and that's where you'll find Battle Lake sitting there against a forested slope. Uh, and here along the the side of uh, State Highway 70, you'll find a historical marker. And here is what it says. Thomas A. Edison camped near this spot in 1878 while on a fishing trip. It was here that his attention was directed to the fiber from his bamboo fishing pole, which he tested as a suitable filament for his incandescent electric lamp. Well, the claim put more plainly elsewhere is that it was here at Battle Lake that Edison, in a flash of inspiration, invented his light bulb. Well, this was intriguing. I wanted to know, is that true? Well, what better place to look than True West magazine? <laughs> well, indeed, back in the 1960s, they ran an article on it. It is a fact that Edison came to Wyoming in 1878, just before he invented the light bulb. He did go fishing at Battle Lake. And what brought him to Wyoming? Well, he was in the West with a bunch of astronomers, and they had come to observe a total solar eclipse. So that is Edison right there, second from the right. So I decided to look into this, to delve into the archives, to go back in time, to learn why Edison came for the eclipse. Who were his companions? Why was the eclipse so important? 
and what lasting impact did it have? Now let me say right off the bat that the light bulb story is a legend. Edison did not invent the incandescent lamp uh, on the shores of Battle Lake, but the true story is no less compelling. As I discovered and as I write in my book, Edison and others who came west in 1878 did change America in some profound ways, and the eclipse was the catalyst. So let me tell you the true story of the scientists who raced to the American frontier for the total solar eclipse of 1878. So first, some context. In 1878, the general outlines of modern America were already in place. Our national borders looked like they do today. The Civil War was over. The nation had 38 states. The most recent addition was Colorado. We were a vibrant, can-do nation, population 50 million and growing fast. We were building big cities and we were spreading west. The mindset, the rallying cry was manifest destiny. The Transcontinental Railroad had recently been completed, opening new territory to settlement and sparking clashes between the pioneers and Native Americans who found their land and way of life threatened. We were a rapidly developing adolescent nation. We had just celebrated our 100th birthday, and we were, you might say, intellectually immature. Europe was the center of Western culture. That's where respectable literature and music and art was produced, and Europe led the world in science. In fact, Europe led the world in chasing eclipses. So let me just say a little bit about, about what causes an eclipse. Of course, a solar eclipse ha occurs when the moon passes between the sun and the earth, and so the moon casts its shadow onto the earth. And if we zoom in a little bit on this portion here, the moon's shadow actually has two different uh, parts to it. This outer zone, this large circle here, that's the moon's penumbra. That's a zone of partial shadow, and anyone in this area will see a partial solar eclipse. But it's only here in the dark shadow, the umbra, and that small circle where you will see a total solar eclipse. But that, the umbra is the, the dark spot of the shadow is moving across the Earth at high speed. And so what happens is you trace out this path, that is the path of totality for this particular eclipse. So if you, uh, as about once every 18 months, somewhere on the planet, there will be a total solar eclipse. And so over time, they trace out paths across uh, the, the Earth, sort of like spaghetti thrown at a map. So this, these are the paths of totality of eclipses from 1842 and 1890 to 1893. And this was a particularly important time for solar eclipses because at that time, total eclipses were not just interesting spectacles to, to gawk at, they were really important to science. And that's because astronomers were just starting to unravel the mysteries of the sun. You know, what is this giant ball of fire in the sky? What is it made of? What fuels it? And there were certain studies that they could do only during those brief few minutes of a total solar eclipse. During a total eclipse, the moon blocks the bright surface of the sun, allowing you to see what's around the edge of the sun. These uh, features called prominences, and of course the ethereal corona as well. So during this era, whenever a total eclipse was predicted, such as this one in India in 1871, astronomers took their equipment, their telescopes and spectroscopes, and they headed off to sit in the path of totality. They'd hoped that clouds didn't show up, and they'd frantically conduct their observations in those two or three minutes of midday darkness. This is a British team in India in 1871. Now, the United States did launch eclipse expeditions too, but the Europeans were the clear leaders. Until, that is, 1878, when the moon's shadow was set to visit our own backyard. The date was July 29th, 1878, and the path of totality ran right down the American frontier, Wyoming territory to Texas, uh, rather Monta Montana territory to Texas. So this was America's chance to shine or an opportunity for us to slip up and embarrass ourselves. But if all went well, we would show the rest of the world what we were capable of as a scientific nation. And so the eclipse was a big national undertaking. The US government issued official instructions for observing the eclipse, how to view it safely, and how to collect information that could help astronomers. 
Now, the solar corona, what today we know is the outer atmosphere of the sun, back then was a great mystery. Just characterizing its shape and size was important to science. So uh, in an early form of crowdsourcing, federal scientists asked people who were artistically inclined to sketch the corona and submit their drawings to Washington. So the instructions included a template you could use and an example of what a proper drawing might look like showing the contours of the inner and outer corona. Well, the, the government also encouraged professional astronomers to go west for the eclipse, and it, it gave uh, logistical advice on train travel and so forth. And the US Naval Observatory put out the call for scientists volunteers to participate in a half dozen government eclipse expeditions that were being assembled. Well, the responses to these invitations came back like RSVPs to a wedding invitation. So here you'll see the Cincinnati Observatory accepts the invitation. The Morrison Observatory accepts. Yale College accepts. Harvard sends its regrets. <clears throat> so the government assembled its scientific parties and dispatched them to the frontier to meet the moon's shadow. Uh, this is one naval observatory team that set up its, uh, its observation post on the roof of a hotel in the gold mining town of Central City, Colorado. Uh, Denver was also in the path of totality, and that's where a team from Princeton <coughs> camped out for a month preparing for the eclipse. To the north, in Wyoming, this camp was established by the U.S. Naval Observatory beside the Transcontinental Railroad. You can see the telescopes here poking out of a crude observatory that had been built with a canvas roof. And also in Wyoming, of course, was this group. So let me talk a little bit about this extraordinary collection of talent that gathered in the rough and tumble railroad town of Rawlins, Wyoming. And I'll mention just a few of these esteemed individuals, and I'll zoom in here on this section on the right. So again, that's Thomas Edison, and I'll get to him in a minute. But to the right over here, that's Norman Lockyer. He was a British astronomer, the man who famously identified the element helium in the sun before it was ever discovered on Earth. He was also the founding editor of the journal Nature. Uh, here on the left side here, standing beside his wife Annette, that large fellow is James Craig Watson. Uh, Watson was a professor of astronomy at the University of Michigan, and this was where he worked, uh, the Detroit Observatory in Ann Arbor. And Watson was known in that era as a planet hunter. Now, if you were to look at a solar system chart from that time, like this one from 1846, you'll notice that it's different from a diagram you'd see today. First, if we zoom in on the section between Mars and Jupiter, you'll see it goes Mars, Vesta, Juno, Ceres, Pallas, Jupiter. Well, those are the this is the asteroid belt. Those are asteroids. And back then, asteroids were considered planets. They were considered minor planets, but they got names just like the main ones, and finding them was a big deal. Well, James Craig Watson had a knack for discovering asteroids and was one of the top planet hunters in the world. Now, if we zoom in to the central part of the solar system, you'll notice something even more puzzling. Between uh, Mercury and the Sun, there's another planet, Vulcan. <clears throat> well, uh, Vulcan was a hypothetical planet. Uh, astro many astronomers believed that Vulcan had to exist because Mercury's orbit didn't make sense otherwise. Mercury, uh, according to Newtonian mechanics, was not behaving the way it should. And the only way they could explain it was, it seemed there must be some mass, a planet or perhaps several, between Mercury and the Sun that was tugging Mercury along. But no one had ever reliably seen Vulcan. Now, that wasn't a surprise. It's so close to the sun, it would never be in the sky at night. And you couldn't see it in the daytime because it's, so it's in the glare of the sun. About the only time you might catch a glimpse of Vulcan was during the brief midday darkness of a total solar eclipse. So James Craig Watson came to Wyoming determined to find Vulcan. Now, as for Thomas Edison, he was just 31 years old, but he was already a global celebrity due to a recent invention, and that was this, the phonograph. This simple contraption with a hand crank and tin foil to record sound was an absolute sensation. Before Edison, no one even imagined that it was possible to capture and release sound at will. 
Edison was hailed as a genius. He was called a wizard. He was, in fact, the wizard of Menlo Park, because his lab was in Menlo Park, New Jersey. And at this point, he, uh, he was ridiculously productive and creative. He was dreaming up strange and wondrous inventions. There was uh, this, the aerophone, which was an enormous loudspeaker that he suggested could be installed in, light, in lighthouses to shout warnings at ships. There was the phonomotor, which used the power of the human voice to turn a wheel. And there was this, the tesimeter. Now, the tesimeter was an extremely sensitive heat detector. It was basically an electric thermometer that Edison claimed could measure changes in temperature as small as one millionth of a degree Fahrenheit. Today, we would call the tesimeter an infrared detector. Uh, basically, it allows heat radiation to come in this bell which then impinges on that rod of hard rubber labeled A. It, when it heats up, it expands, pressing down here on this thing labeled C, which is a, a disk of carbon. Uh, that's in an electrical circuit, and the carbon's conductivity changes with pressure. So changes in heat become changes in the electrical current, and you can read that on a meter. Now, an astronomer had encouraged Edison to create the tesimeter to use in astronomy. Uh, in fact, Several astronomers were keen to use it at the eclipse because they wanted to see if, if the corona, this strange thing around the sun, gave off heat as well as light. And Edison, in the end, decided he would come along and do the experiment himself uh, to show that he was not just some tinkerer, he wasn't just an inventor, he was a real scientist. Uh, but these were not the most serious of surroundings. This was the Wild West, after all. And Edison ended up attaching his tesimeter to a telescope, which is poking out right here from this building that looks a little like an outhouse. It's actually a hen house that Edison uh, retrofitted into a makeshift observatory. Now, there were dozens of notable scientists who came to the West to observe the eclipse. And in my book, I write about a lot of them. But the main characters I focus on are Edison, Watson, the planet hunter, and a third scientist who traveled to the frontier with very different intent. This was Mariah Mitchell. She was by far the best known female scientist in America back in the 19th century. She first came to prominence in 1847 when, living on Nantucket at the time, she discovered a comet and earned a gold medal from the King of Denmark. By 1878, she was working at Vassar, the pioneering women's college. No surprise, Mitchell was a staunch advocate for women's higher education. And this was a time when women's colleges were under attack. You see, in 1873, a sensational best-selling book came out that claimed that college education could ruin a girl's health. <laughs> it was written by a Harvard doctor, Edward H. Clark, who argued that by taxing the brain, education sapped energy from other parts of a girl's maturing body, including her reproductive organs, and therefore higher learning could turn female college students into sterile masculine invalids. And I am not kidding about this. He, he wrote uh, that education could, quote, could re result, quote, in a dropping out of maternal instincts and an appearance of Amazonian coarseness and force. <laughs> Such persons are analogous to the sexless class of termites. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, Mariah Mitchell believed that this was ridiculous. She encouraged young women to use their brains in her astronomy courses at Vassar. But that wasn't enough. She needed to convince the American society that Dr. Clark's book was rubbish. So in 1878, she did something remarkable. As groups of men were assembling eclipse expeditions to Wyoming and Colorado, she assembled an all-female expedition. And here is the Vassar College Eclipse Party in Denver. There's Mariah Mitchell, that's her sister Phoebe. The others are recent graduates of Vassar. And it wasn't just a scientific endeavor, it was, in essence, political theater to demonstrate to a skeptical public that women could be smart, educated, healthy, and feminine to boot. So these three main characters of mine had a lot on the line. Edison was out to prove the value of his tesimeter and to prove himself a scientist. Watson was out to find Vulcan 
and the glory that would come with the dis discovering the planet. And Mitchell was out to change minds about the role of women in science and higher education. So in this, and in other ways, the eclipse was a competition, and the public followed closely the various players and what they were out to achieve. This country that was not known for embracing science suddenly cared about astronomy. Newspapers met the demand for information by providing extensive coverage. This is the Chicago Tribune from a week before the eclipse. You can see it's got a map of the path of totality and shows what, the, what stars you might see during the total eclipse and what the eclipse would look like in Chicago, where it would be partial. And the, the paper talked about what the scientists were up to. And although Chicago was outside the path of totality, people were keen to get a front row seat. So there were advertisements for eclipse tours. Just like today, the public headed to the path of totality, and the destination for most eclipse tourists was Denver. The city was overrun with visitors. The hotels ran out of rooms. Uh, guests were left to sleep on cots in hotel parlors and dining rooms, and one gentleman reportedly slept on a billiard table. The public procured eclipse glasses. Now, there were no mass-produced glasses with mylar lenses and cardboard frames that you'll get today, but newsboys took shards of glass and smoked them over flames or collected pieces of colored glass. This fellow's holding a piece of blue glass, you'll see and they sold them on street corners. Here's your colored glass for seeing the eclipse, the newsboys cried. And this is verbatim from an 1878 article. Genuine French imported Mazarin blue, London smoke and bottle green, three kinds, three cents each, or two for five. Well, I have to say, immersing myself in this history was tremendous fun. Reading old newspaper reports, reading these scientific reports, cast me back in time. And I enjoyed tracking down what remains from that era as I retraced my character's footsteps. So I went to Vassar and visited the observatory that Mariah Mitchell oversaw during her time there and that she still presides over, although now as a bronze bust. I visited Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory, which was reconstructed by Henry Ford in Michigan. And that's where I found a tesimeter. Also in Michigan, you can find James Craig Watson's Detroit Observatory in Ann Arbor. And nearby in Ypsilanti, I tracked down the telescope that he brought to Wyoming to look for Vulcan. So that telescope is this one right here in that photograph. <clears throat> uh, and I also went to where that photograph was taken. It was a little bit of a disappointment. It's a parking lot now <clears throat> at the post office in Rollins. <clears throat> But most of my research was done in Washington at the Library of Congress and at the National Archives because it's here that a lot of the original documents have been stored. Crumbling envelopes and files filled with letters and telegrams and scientific reports. And remember I told you that the government was interested in artwork of the eclipse. Well, the general public and scientists submitted their drawings and paintings of the corona from simple pencil sketches like this one, it's a little hard to see, but you can see the circle here and what looks like hair coming off. Uh, this one's easier to see. This was actually drawn by Wyoming's territorial governor who was on hand for the eclipse. Other depictions were more elaborate. I just love this watercolor. And this pastel. Uh, and this elaborate piece of artwork was produced by a British amateur astronomer who came to Denver for the eclipse. And this view, which also happens to be my tie, um, was uh, the view from uh, 14,000 feet up on top of Pikes Peak, Colorado, where a number of particularly hardy scientists were up there battling snowstorms in July and serious altitude sickness to witness the eclipse. <clears throat> Anyway, as you can tell, on Eclipse Day itself, many people enjoyed an amazing view of the spectacle. And it was a proud and exciting day for my three main characters. Now, I do not want to spoil the story by giving everything away, but Edison and the test of his dosimeter, Mariah Mitchell in her quest to change public attitudes, even Watson in his quest for Vulcan, they all were quite pleased with how things turned out. And the headlines after the eclipse were effusive. Great results, announced a Chicago paper. Most important observations ever made, said the New York Herald. It was a banner day for these scientists, and it was for America, too. 
The eclipse that crossed the frontier enabled this young country to prove to the world that it could do serious science. It could take on Europe. As one local boasted to a visitor from England, Sir, Colorado can beat the world in eclipses as in everything else. <laughs> well, the Rocky Mountain eclipse helped boost America's interest in science and bolstered its confidence in that realm. Now, admittedly, the specific achievements of my characters did not quite pan out. Mariah Mitchell did help open the doors of science and higher education to women, but it's not like male scientists suddenly embraced their female counterparts. It was the beginning of a long, hard, continuing struggle. Uh, Watson, did he really discover Vulcan? Well, I'll leave you to read my book to find that out, but you can probably guess. As for Edison's Tezimeter, it never did live up to its hype. And Edison quickly turned to other projects. In fact, the day after he returned from Wyoming, he started work on a new invention. Now, there are some connections between the eclipse and the light bulb. The scientists that Edison spent time with, with in the West encouraged him to turn his energies to electric light and power. And the time away from the laboratory left him refreshed and ready to take on new challenges. But did Edison dream up the light bulb on the shores of Battle Lake? No. The eclipse of 1878 did not illuminate America in the way the historical marker claims. However, it did enlighten America, helping to push this upstart nation toward what it soon would become, the undeniable global superpower in science, a country that would, in this intellectual realm, eclipse the world. And so, here is the path of the eclipse of 1878, and that is the path of the eclipse of 2017. And once again, the moon's shadow will visit us at an interesting time in our intellectual development. Today, the issue isn't whether we can rise up and take on the world in science. The question is whether America can maintain its global lead. Our nation's impending decline in science isn't exactly a new concern. This Time Magazine cover is from 2006, but if anything, the worry has grown. Just two months ago, thousands filled the streets in the March for Science. Many fear that an anti-science sentiment is on the rise. Activists are trying to remind the general public that well-funded research is a societal good. It makes us all stronger. And of course, there's a continuing push among educators to teach our kids science and math, to prepare them for the jobs of the future and to bolster America's high-tech economy. So just now, when many believe that the science could use a boost, along comes our old friend, the shadow of the moon. So this is what's going to happen on August 21st. The uh, moon's shadow will first come ashore just north of Newport, Oregon at 10.15 in the morning Pacific time. It'll race eastward over 1,500 miles an hour across Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, Nebraska, a little bit of Kansas, then over part of Kansas City, part of St. Louis, southern Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, the Carolinas, and a little bit of Georgia, and it will pass out over the Atlantic at 2.49 p.m. Eastern Time, right around Charleston. Now, that wonderful animation was made by NASA, and just as the U.S. government 139 years ago took responsibility for educating the public about the coming eclipse, you'll remember the instructions that the Naval Observatory issued back then. Today, NASA is playing that role. Of course, instead of printing and distributing pamphlets, NASA's produced a special eclipse website with videos and information on eclipse science, eye safety, eclipse-related events, and so forth. Back in 1878, teams of scientists, like the one from Princeton, headed to the path of totality to study the solar corona. Scientists will do the same this year. This group from the University of Hawaii will be observing in Oregon and Wyoming. Back in 1878, there was a call for help from citizen scientists. There is again. One of several crowdsourcing projects is called the Eclipse Mega Movie. And rather than soliciting hand drawings of the corona, they're asking volunteers to take photos and videos with their smartphones, which will then be assembled together into a, a movie of how the solar corona evolved during the hour and a half that it took for the moon's shadow to cross the country. Back in 1878, newspapers took their role seriously in educating the public. The media is starting to play that role today, and you can be sure that there will be a tremendous amount of coverage leading up to August 21st. 
Many other organizations are helping to spread the word. The American Astronomical Society, Science Museums, the U.S. Postal Service, which two weeks from now will issue a special total solar eclipse forever stamp. And this will be a first of its kind stamp. It has heat sensitive ink. When you press your thumb over the black moon, <laughs> it lights up. Uh, even private companies are getting involved. A St. Louis brewery is issuing a special Path of Totality pack of beer, complete with a free pair of eclipse glasses inside and eclipse information on the back. So mark my words, the eclipse will be huge. There is no question that it will be the most witnessed total solar eclipse in U.S. history, probably the most witnessed total solar eclipse in world history. Indeed, it may end up being the biggest one day mass migration of humanity ever. <laughs> if you look at a map of the path of totality, 12.2 million Americans live where the moon's shadow will fall. But if you then you ask, well, how many people could drive there in a couple of hours? Well, how many are within 100 miles of the eclipse path? 47 million Americans. All right, what about 200 miles or 300 miles? That's still a reasonable one-day drive. Over a third of the population of the United States lives that close to the path of totality. And if you continue this exercise, well, eventually you'll see that pretty much just about every American lives within 900 miles of the path of totality. In a four-day weekend with a lot of driving, you could do that. Uh, now, not everyone will take the drive, but a lot of people will. Southern Illinois University, which sits in the path of totality, is bracing for 50,000 visitors to its campus on Eclipse Day. Indeed, one of its high-rise uh, dormitories, this one on the left, was slated for demolition, but they've decided to use it for overflow eclipse housing. <laughs> Wyoming expects as many as 350,000 out-of-state visitors. Idaho, half a million. Oregon, a million. In South Carolina, the city of Columbia alone forecasts a million visitors. Some small towns expect their populations to grow tenfold in a day. They will be overrun not just by Americans, but by tour groups from Japan, Israel, uh, the UK, Germany. I mean, this could be a logistical nightmare. Emergency planning professionals are putting out white papers and working with communities to prepare for the onslaught. Some have suggested that towns in the path of totality treat the eclipse like a natural disaster. Communities need to make sure that there's plenty of bottled water at the supermarkets, fuel at the gas stations, cash in the ATMs, porta potties strategically placed around town. They need to make sure that the, the hospital emergency room and the ambulance services are fully staffed. But of course, the eclipse is a natural disaster with a tremendous upside. It is a, an extraordinary teachable moment one that we should not squander. It is a chance to engage our kids with the wonders of the universe. And this will be true across the entire country. All of North America on August 21st will experience at least a partial solar eclipse. Here in Narragansett, it will max out at about 72%. So that's what it'll look like at its peak at 2.47 in the afternoon on August 21st here. And you'll be able to watch the total eclipse online. NASA, the Exploratorium, PBS, Nova, they're going to be offering live streaming, and I'm sure that the major TV networks will be uh, covering it live on TV as well. But I would urge you, if at all possible, not to settle for a partial eclipse overhead and a total eclipse on your screen. You really should go see it for yourself. A total solar eclipse is a transcendent experience, not only because it's so unearthly, but because it transcends age and place and time. It connects us with history. Witnessing a total solar eclipse today is the same deeply human experience that it was even 200 years ago. In 1806, the American novelist James Fenimore Cooper experienced a total solar eclipse in his hometown of Cooperstown, New York. He was 17 years old at the time. 
And many years later, he wrote up his memories of what was for him the most profound experience of his life. Indeed, it was a profound experience for his entire community. Women stood in the open street near me with streaming eyes and clasped hands, Cooper wrote, and sobs were audible in different directions. Even the educated and reflecting men at my side continued silent in thought. I have passed a varied and eventful life, Cooper wrote in later years. It has been my fortune to see earth, heavens, ocean, and man in most of their aspects, but never have I beheld any spectacle which so plainly manifested the majesty of the Creator or so forcibly taught the lesson of humility to man as a total eclipse of the sun. Thank you.